Good morning, Sharptown. We are so glad that you've chosen to join us this morning for this time of worship, and we look forward to having the opportunity to share with you once again in our series, The Crosswords, words that we think about on the way to the cross of Jesus Christ. As we continue on in our series today, we have the opportunity to lift up our voices, to give God thanks and praise, and I invite you to join us for worship. The Bible tells us that this is the day the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. And then also I'm reminded that Scripture tells us that we, when we gather together, whether it's 2 or 3, whether it's 10 or 11, or whether we're gathered together online this morning, that Jesus Christ can be high and lifted up and glorified and we can give Him praise. So this morning, Sharptown, I'd like to invite you to... Get comfortable, we're going to share a few songs of worship, have the opportunity to open God's word, and we look forward to being with you during this time together so that Christ might be glorified. Pause with me for just a brief word of prayer. We invite you, Lord, into our living rooms, we invite you into our our bedrooms this morning, we invite you into the places where we're watching today, as well as we invite you into this place as we lift up your name. Thank you that you can be glorified at all places at one time, and we would pray today that in the name of Jesus Christ, that you'll come by your Holy Spirit. We pray that we would not only sense that you're drawing us together, even though we're apart, but also that you would be lifted during this time together and draw people to yourself, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Sharptown family. Um, This first song, Love the Lord, right from Scripture. There's an account in scripture where Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment? And he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what? We're also going to sing, we will serve the Lord, praise the Lord, and trust the Lord in this song. So let's uh, lift this up just just like we were here. Sing after me.
sing about God's love that never fails us.
Well, amen, hallelujah. It is so fun seeing you all on Facebook Live with us this morning. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Praise team, I'm not sure if you know this, but everybody at the women's retreat the last couple years is home right now this morning and was dancing to love the Lord your God, and they're all posting that on Facebook. And so that's a whole lot of fun. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for online church this morning. If you are here with us this morning, take a moment and let us know your attendance right now. So just drop there in your comment feed how many are worshiping with you. We would love to know how many are with us this morning. So we have some cool things happening here in the life of Sharptown, and we sent you a mailer this week. And so I want you to watch for that in the mail. There's lots of information about things that are coming up and how you can get on some of our online feeds. One of the cool things that we are doing is our women's committee is having an hour of prayer on Tuesday mornings from 8 to 9. And so you can call in to the number there. This is on the church website. If you missed that, you can call in and stay with Sharon Ruff and Marilyn Lefevre during the hour and have a time of prayer. In addition to that, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And even if we cannot be together, we are going to be jumping up and down. Not only is it Palm Sunday... It's Communion Sunday as well. And so, Sharptown folks, we are going to have communion together yet apart. And so you'll see there on the screen, that is what, like, ready-made communion cups look like. So we're going to invite you on Thursday evening between 5 and 7 to stop curbside and pick up ready-made communion cups. You can pick them up if you live in Woolwich from Pastor Jerry's Curb. He won't breathe on you. You can't breathe on him, but he'll be there just throwing them in your car. If you're in Pennsville, you'll swing into the AJ's parking lot. Just pull right in, and we'll throw them to you. You can swing by here at the church or at Hudox, which is a landmark there in the Salem Quinton area. So Thursday evening, 5 to 7, swing by and get your communion cups, and you will be able to partake communion at home next week. If you miss Thursday evening, you can come by the church here on Saturday and pick them up between 9 and 11. In addition to that, we are going to go to the movies together on Friday night. We're going to host a Netflix movie party. And so a kid's movie is shown at 6.30, and then a family-friendly, all-family movie at 8.30. And so it's a little tricky to get onto that, but I trust that you can do that. Directions are on the church website. They're on the mailer. You will need a Netflix account, and you'll need the Netflix party Google extension on your computer. And so see if you can get that done this week. Join us for Sharptown Movie next week. So a couple things that you already know, I hope. Graceland Lessons, Sharptown Kids Parents Facebook page, Spin via Zoom, Youth Group and Young Adults via Zoom and YouTube. That is all happening, and that's all on the Facebook page. If you have questions about that, you can contact those ministry leaders, Dawn, Ben, or Joe. And then I think we just have like two more things. We love that you have joined us for the daily messages at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. We've loved being with you in the mornings. We've loved your comments and the ways that you've encouraged each other. That is going to continue this week. You're in treat for tomorrow because Pastor Jerry is up tomorrow. So that's kind of all the announcements that we have this morning. At this time, I want to encourage you to give if you can online. And you can. there's four ways that you can give. You can jump on the computer and give through our online program. You can give through the app on your phone. You can mail a check to the church, or you could stop by and put it in the mailbox if you wanted. So at this time, we encourage you to do that if you can from home. We are grateful for the way that you continue to support the ministries of Sharptown Church and God's kingdom. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the ways that you continue to provide. We pray that as we give this morning, that you would bless what's given to advance your kingdom. Lord Jesus, continue to direct our paths, and we will be sure to follow you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
we'd like you to continue to worship with us as we sing to the king. My favorite <clears throat> part of this is uh, the second half of the chorus. It says, to lift up a heart of praise, sing now with voices raised to Jesus, sing to the king. And let's keep that as our thought and prayer today. Amen. <laughs> And Sharptown family, that is something that we sing about this morning, that Jesus is all that we need. 
So you can probably hear in my voice that I have a little bit of a head cold, so you could be praying for me. And for this reason only, I was in Walmart yesterday, and I happened to call for just a moment. People flew out of the aisle like cockroaches when the lights came on. And so, you know, that's an uncomfortable feeling. That may be the case for some of you. And so we want to pray for our folks that who are sick. Um, we have had, uh, the Humes family has had unexpected loss in their family this week, and so we want to keep them in prayer. When I spoke to you on Monday morning with the daily messages, I encouraged you to reach out to the folks who sit around you at Sharptown Church. And I probably got 40 diagrams here of people that just drew in pictures of those that sit around them. This morning, I'm just going to encourage you as we go to prayer time, as you think about the folks who you typically would be sitting next to, in front of, and behind on a Sunday morning, that you stop and you take a moment and you lift them before the kingdom. In addition to that, we uh, know that there's just some folks who are struggling, who are going through some hard times, who are feeling isolated and discouraged, and we want to continue to be praying for our church body and for those around us. I want to remind you again that even though we are apart, we are together, we love you, we care about you, we're thinking about you, and we're taking requests this morning. So I just want to thank the band on behalf of Matt and Tiffany Piscina, who reached out this week and said, you know what I'd love to hear? 10,000 reasons. And so thank you, Mike and team, for making that happen. We hear you, and we love that we can communicate with one another, even if it's through text and email. Uh, let's take a moment to bow before the king. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning recognizing that our world is in turmoil. But Lord, as we have heard over and over and over again this week, you still sit on the throne. Lord, you still can be trusted. You are faithful. We have 10,000 reasons to lift your name. Lord, we're grateful that you provide. We're grateful that you care. We're grateful that you love us. Lord, and in this season of Lent, we're reminded once again this morning of what you have done for us on the cross, that that is how much you love us. Lord, don't let us ever, in the midst of our circumstances, not recognize that. Lord, as we gather as your people this morning, we once again put our trust and our faith in you. Lord, for those who are hurting and for those who are struggling and for those who've lost loved ones this week, we think of the Humes family. Lord, we pray that you would be the one that comforts, that you would be the one who stays so close and wipes away tears. Lord, I'm reminded of your words in Scripture that you don't ever leave us and you don't forsake us. Help us to always lean on you first. Lord, we think about the people that we would normally be sitting next to this morning in church. Right about now, we'd be having a greeting time if we were gathered together here physically at Sharptown Church, and we would be shaking hands, and we would be saying hello, and we'd be catching up on each other's lives. And Lord, right now, we just can't do that physically, but we're grateful for technology that makes a way that we can. And so, Lord, as we think about those folks who would normally be sitting next to us and would be sitting in front of us and would be sitting behind us, I pray that we would just take a moment and we would lift them before you by name. Lord, some of those folks we've talked to this week, some we haven't. Some of their needs, we know what they are, and there's many needs that we don't know. But, Lord, we know that you know all. And so, Lord, all we have to do is whisper a name and you intercede. Lord, we're grateful that the Holy Spirit kneels at your feet and intercedes on our behalf, saying the prayers for us that we don't even know what to say. And so this morning, as we pray for our friends, that you would meet them right where they are. Lord, this morning we want to take up a moment and we want to pray for our health care workers and for our police officers and for our first responders. Lord, we think about the folks who are working in the grocery stores. 
in the hardware stores and the convenience stores, Lord, putting themselves out there for us. Lord, I pray that you would give them peace. I pray that you would keep them healthy. I pray that you would restore their energy. Lord, I pray that you would hold them close and that you would hold them tight. Lord, for our leaders who are making impossible decisions, Lord, I pray that you would give them wisdom that as our country turns its eyes towards you, that you would provide wisdom and that you would provide healing. We know that you're the great physician. Lord, and we trust you. Lord, for folks who are stuck at home, for folks who are isolated, for folks who are lonely, stay close. Lord, for folks that we know that are sick, Lord, will you touch their bodies and will you make them well? We hear the music in the background, it is well. Lord, no matter what is happening around the world, may it be well with our soul because of who you are. Lord, we give these next few moments to you. Lord, we pray that you would equip and empower Doug to bring a message to us. May our hearts be open to hear. May you speak through him. We love you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Once again, good morning, Sharp Town. It's uh, good to be with you here this morning. I, I want to say thank you uh, to uh, the staff here at Sharptown. <clears throat> I'm so grateful for the way in which they continue to uh, gather together. We've been praying for one another. We've been praying for you. We've been having the opportunity to try to make wise decisions in the midst of uh, not easy times in the life of our church family, and so I want to say thank you. Some of you have had the opportunity to reach out and ask the question about uh, how is the church doing uh, during this time when we've not been here at all? I just want to say to you, thank you for your faithfulness. Last Sunday, last Sunday, because of online giving and because of your faithfulness, and some of you went ahead and, and jumped on during the service and you clicked and, and you went ahead and for the very first time you gave online, uh, last Sunday, of the weekly need at Sharptown Church, 83% of the weekly need was given last Sunday. And I want to say how grateful I am for that. You continue by your faithfulness to sustain the ministry here. And I just want to encourage you, let's continue while we're apart uh, to continue to be faithfulness in our stewardship. Uh, that until we're back together again, uh, we have the chance to stand with families and stand with people inside of our community because as you know, the ministry here at Sharptown Church is not just about serving those who would attend on Sunday, but we have a broad reach inside of our community, a broad reach inside of our county and our region. And so I want to invite you to continue to be faithful. Thank you so much. I'll try to continue, whether it's through the daily messages or whether it's through uh, Sunday morning to make you apprised of how we're doing and uh, let you know about our faithfulness. The other uh, item I wanted to just to draw to your attention, a couple things if I could. Uh, the first is that uh, we are going to try something new and different this evening. Uh, the administrative board at Sharptown Church is going to try to gather tonight at 7 o'clock uh, in a Zoom meeting. Uh, listen, talk about being out of my comfort zone. That's kind of fun. But uh, we have a large screen TV across the street uh, in our, our copy machine room. 
Uh, we're going to put the computer and plug that into that screen. You, the administrative board, are going to log in and your pictures are going to come up on the screen and so we'll be able to see one another and uh, be with uh, one another this evening for about 45 minutes at 7 o'clock. Uh, and those of you who are on the administrative board, if you've not received a link to that Zoom meeting, please text Kristen uh, or text me. We want to make sure that you receive that invitation. As Chris mentioned to you, next Sunday is communion, and it's uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, I'm still not quite sure how we're going to go ahead and to function uh, with that line of the song that says, Shout Hosanna, and then have you shout Hosanna. I've been thinking that through. I don't know. I'm thinking maybe you just need in capital is the shout Hosanna at the feed at the bottom in the Facebook page, uh, but the one thing that's stood apart uh, for Sharptown Church is we've enjoyed uh, to share that song together. It's been part of our tradition and part of our culture. And then next Sunday is also a time together for communion as we begin Holy Week together. Now the very first time I took communion uh, this way was standing in a large open field uh, at one of those large concert creation type events and they handed out these uh, cups and, and I know that you can't see this but I just wanted to hold this up and show you that this is like a communion cup but in the top uh, there is a prepackaged wafer and so we are going to hand these out at four locations around our county on Thursday evening and from 5 o'clock until 7 o'clock and we want you to drive by and, and grab enough your family, or if there are guests, or if you want to invite some people to share communion with us on Facebook Live next Sunday, we have a few extras, and so you're welcome to take them. If you miss us on Thursday, or you're unable to go ahead and get by the, the, these locations that we have designated inside of our county, we want you to swing by the church uh, next Saturday morning. Again, we'll have these, and we want to hand them out to you uh, so that we might all commune together next Sunday. And so please kind of make note, set your alarm on your phone right now from 5 o'clock until 7 o'clock on Thursday that you're going to need to get in the car and drive to one of these locations and pick up communion uh, for next Sunday. And so uh, we want to go ahead and uh, to just invite you in that capacity. I've really appreciated the effort that you've taken so that we can be uh, together even though we're apart. I wanted to just to share a couple of things with you uh, around that that happened for me this past week. Let's go to the next slide if we could. Uh, so this uh, was uh, sitting on my front porch with homemade banana nut muffins, which is always a good thing. And, uh, and so kids were home uh, with their mom and dad this week, and they were uh, needing something to do. And so mom and dad decided, hey, listen, let's go ahead and bake uh, for people around. And so the reason why this is all crumpled up is because I carried this with me all week inside of my pocket. Uh, I just wanted to be reminded how important it was to be people who spread cheer, not fear. And so I want to say thank you, thank you, uh, Sharptown Church, for including me and I thought that that was just a wonderful surprise uh, when I opened the front door on my front porch. Uh, this next slide came to me uh, through a picture uh, that someone had sent to me this week. Uh, this is from the 1115 service. My uh, dear friend uh, Gracie Carpenter, uh, she sits right over here uh, with her mom and dad, John and Julie, and with her grandparents, uh, Mike and Laurie and her great parents, John and Lucy. And they sit right over here uh, in the 1115 service. And so Gracie uh, was uh, at home and she was building, playing some blocks. And uh, grandparents said, what are you doing? She said, she's building the church. And uh, make no mistake about it, she is in fact building the church. And so they wanted to know, uh, what's that on top? And so we have a small red circle there at the top. She said that that's Pastor Doug. And so uh, I thought that that was great. Uh, I thought maybe I could just go ahead and climb the roof of the old church so I can wave to Gracie. But I want to say, Grace, uh, nice to see you uh, this morning. And thank you so much for uh, helping me and encouraging me this week by some of the things that you've sent as we try to be together, even though we're apart. 
<clears throat> I wanted to talk with you today one more time about the theme that we've been thinking together during the Lenten series. The idea that there is, in fact, words that we encounter at this time of the year, at this calendar time of the year, during the Lenten series or during the Lenten season, that we don't encounter or we don't think about at any other time during the calendar year. Let's go to the next slide if we could. This has a chance to go ahead and we want to read this section of scripture because out of John chapter 19 it talks to us about the actual event of the crucifixion of Jesus. And so I want to pick this up if I could and, and work through uh, this section and then one topic that pertains to this that's very important for us to consider this morning. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus and they were carrying uh, his own cross and so they went out to the place of the skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha or Golgotha. There they crucified Jesus and with him two others. On each side of Jesus he was in the middle. Pilate noticed, excuse me, Pilate had a notice and prepared and he fastened to the cross a sign that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read the sign. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, and it was written in Latin, and also in Greek, so that everyone could read that, that he was Jesus Christ, the person who was King of the Jews. The chief priests and the Jews, they protested in Pilate and said, don't write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, uh, what have you written? I've written what I've written. And so when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and they divided them into four shares and one of, in each of them and with the undergarments remaining. And the garments were seamless, woven in one place from top to bottom. Let's go to the next slide, please. Don't tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide who will get them. And this happened so that scripture might be fulfilled in the Old Testament that said, they divided my clothes among them and they cast lots for my garment. And so this is what the soldiers did. I want to go ahead and think with you then a little bit about the idea the, of the crucifixion of Jesus pertaining to one very specific circumstance and one very specific item inside of the Bible. In particular, as we've mentioned repeatedly, that the gospel writers seem to crescendo the events of the cross. All of them write about the life of Jesus. All of them write about the crucifixion of Jesus. And they all take a significant amount of time moving to this particular place inside of the life of Christ, the crucifixion. I grew up inside of a church that did hymn sings. I've shared that with you just a couple of weeks. We had a chance to sing through some of the great hymns of the church. Let's go to the next slide if we could. And this is one of them. And it's a situation and a song that we sing uh, that there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood in the blood of the Lamb. A few weeks ago, we talked about the idea that Jesus was, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want to back up, if I could then, and to think with you a little bit about the idea of crucifixion, the symbolism that happens there upon the cross, and the meaning for the blood of Jesus Christ that has been shed for you and for me. When I was uh, going to Malaga camp, uh, as a, a very young person, I went as a guest for my very first time, and it used to be that the more spiritual you were, the more times you could say the word power and still be in sync with the music. And so I remember singing, there's power, 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 wonder working power, and the more times you could fit in the word power, uh, and you can try that at home, uh, and uh, maybe that's one of the things you can do during the message time that might kind of engage you. The more times you could say the word power, uh, it, for folks would say, you know, they, they would set records in, in situations like that. But what does it mean, actually, when we think about the blood of Jesus Christ? And what does it mean when we consider the fact that his blood was shed for you and for me? It's an image we don't talk about very often inside of the church today. And probably for fairly good reason. Let's go to the next slide if we could. And so, listen, uh, 
Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is me and my sister. Uh, she's three years younger than I am, and uh, it was at Christmas time. So the reason I put this slide up for you is because there's something that kind of happened inside of my life within a couple of years after this that still remains in my mind. Uh, I'm not sure if mom and dad, uh, Smitty and Barbara, they decided they got a two-for-one special, but I remember being checked into the hospital because uh, they were going to take my tonsils out, and my sister was with me. Now, I didn't have any problems doing some of the preoperative testing. I remember going very vividly to the, uh, to the doctors, to the hospital, and, and laying down while they went ahead and, and put a tourniquet here, and they went to draw blood. I did okay when they drew my blood. But when my sister next to me, uh, they wanted to draw her blood, and I watched that, listen, out cold. I don't know why that is. I'm not sure why that happened, and I don't know what it is about the fact that I was able to go ahead and to uh, participate in the drawing of blood, but yet when I watched Debbie have her blood drawn out cold, I remember the smelling salts and all of that. I want to tell you that that didn't get much better when it came time for Julie to go ahead and give birth to our firstborn son, but that's another story completely. I don't even want to go ahead and tell you about that, but you might imagine uh, what happened in those circumstances. The idea of being in situations and in polite company and talking about our response to how blood impacts us, it's kind of an unusual situation. And as a result of that, we don't like to talk about that too very often inside of polite company. As a matter of fact, when we talk about the idea of blood or even the aspect of the blood of Jesus Christ, sometimes inside of 2020 and inside of our culture, it makes people cringe just a bit. It makes people go ahead and withdraw just a little. Let's go to the next slide if I could. I'm working my way through this book by Fleming Rutledge. She's a, an Episcopalian, and she makes this statement, and she has a great observation. She said that <clears throat> she's wondered if the imagery associated with blood today hasn't become dead to middle-class Christian Americans. Living as we do in a high-tech society far removed from real blood and real death let alone sacrificial death, that one person has died for another. We may question, she says, whether the power of shed blood is lost to us. I want to think with you just a little bit about that today. I want to resurrect, if I could, and talk a little bit about the importance of shed blood and the importance of the blood, that there's power, power, Wonder-working power in the blood. Now as you move out of the gospel story, and the gospel story doesn't talk specifically about the graphic nature of the shed blood of Christ. But as you move out of the gospel story, you begin to recognize that as Paul writes, as John writes, as Peter writes, it almost becomes synonymous with the death of Jesus Christ. So that the blood of Christ is meaning the death of Christ. 35 more times inside the New Testament you read the phrase, the blood of Christ. But there is this imagery in the New Testament when you move towards the cross. Five occasions really where you talk about the blood of Jesus or the fact that the blood of Christ was shed or spilled. Some of that is implied and some of that just happens because of the graphic nature of the very the very death of Christ, the fact that uh, he was uh, publicly, publicly beaten for your sin and for mine. We're going to think about that. So here are the five instances in the New Testament where the implication is that Jesus' blood was shed. The first is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Bible says this, that he sweat Drops like blood that fell to the ground, the Gospel of Luke tells us. Then the implication about the flogging of Pilate 
of Jesus and the details surrounding that. Many of you have done a bit more extensive reading about that or have been in small groups where you've talked about uh, the graphic nature of what that flogging looked like as Jesus' back was laid open uh, and uh, he lost an enormous amount of blood during that instant. Then the crown of thorns placed on his head. The implication then was, and you've seen some maybe uh, graphic artwork and artwork that detailed that, that Jesus' blood would shed or would flow because of the thorns placed on his head. The crucifixion and the nature of which the nails were placed in his hands. I was fascinated to understand and come to understand that there is nowhere in the gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that you read that they nailed Jesus' hands. Do you know that the only place that you can find that Jesus' hands were nailed is not in the gospel story around the narrative of the crucifixion. It happens afterwards where Thomas says, if I could see the nails in his hands. And so we know that sometimes people were crucified without their hands being nailed, but that was not the case for Jesus. And so the implication is that Jesus' hands were nailed and his feet were nailed at the cross. In addition to that, we also recognize that a soldier pierced the side of Jesus with a spear. These are the occasions where the physical blood of Jesus was spilled around the crucifixion. There is power, says the hymn writer, there is power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. But I want to take you to a section of Scripture that does not specifically talk about the shed blood of Christ. The gospel stories, they don't tell about in graphic nature about the shed blood. But here, friends, becomes one of the most important, significant verses we find inside of the New Testament that talks about the transaction about what happens on the cross of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Now we do know, and many of us have grown up inside the church and have said that John 3.16 becomes the one singular verse that kind of wraps the gospel story up that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But I want to just commend this verse to you. I'm not sure we can find a verse that's more significant that talks about the crucifixion than this one verse. As a matter of fact, with only just a few words, I've been spending weeks reading through different ideas that the importance of, these, of this verse about the, the, the crucifixion of Christ and the implication for you and for me. And it doesn't mention at all the word blood. So read with me if you will. Look closely. Because there's three miracles and I believe they legitimately are miraculous things that we can draw out of this very small verse. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I, I want to just take a minute and pause there if I could. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's work our way through this, if we could, this morning, and be reminded, so that God made him who had no sin. This is a foundational statement inside of our understanding and inside of our theology. Let's go to the next slide if we could, because the book of Hebrews tells us this, Peter tells us this, the gospel story tells, this, tells us this. As a matter of fact, even Pontius Pilate, you'll recall, when he stood Jesus in front of everyone and he said, who should I release to you? And they said, we want Jesus Barabbas released. And Pilate said, this Jesus, I've found no fault in him. The, Peter says it this way, Jesus committed no sin and there was no deceit found in his mouth. And then the writer to the Hebrews says this, 
that he was tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet he did not sin. And so here, the perfect Lamb of God, says the hymn writer, was placed upon the cross. He was broken. His blood shed for you and for me because he is the one who becomes the sufficient sacrifice. He alone is the one who is sinless, who can die then for a sinful people. It is a miraculous circumstance that we want to go ahead and recognize that Jesus, who had no sin inside of his own personal life, he was encountering sin, he dealt with people all of the time who had sinned, we even read in the book of Romans that all people had committed sin, but yet Christ was sinless, sinless. And so as a perfect, spotless, blameless offering, sacrifice, Jesus Christ dies for the sins of the world. It's important for us to consider that today. The implication surrounding that is dramatic coming out of the Old Testament. And I wish that we had time today to, to pull all of the visual images that have to do with sacrifice and with substitution, that have to do with atonement, that have to do with Passover, and all of that imagery that falls in place around the crucifixion, these three hours where Jesus hangs on the cross and his blood is shed for you and for me. All of the Old Testament imagery and then also some of the New Testament imagery about the communion or the Eucharist or the blood that shed and the bread that shared, all of that comes into play in Jesus Christ's death in these three hours. It's an amazing concept. He had no sin. Now the next sentence or the next phrase becomes critically important. And I think it's important that we parse it and we tweeze out some of the imagery because it's significant. Some of us have grown up in churches perhaps that we've used phrases like, in that instance, Jesus became sin. I want to go ahead and pause, hit the pause button for there just a moment and say that I don't believe that Jesus became sin on the cross as much as he became a sin offering or God placed on him the sin of all of humanity. I don't know that Jesus' holy nature changed in that circumstance. Although I think you can certainly read a number of people who might disagree with me. I want to just use this illustration if I could. Suppose, if you will, for just a moment, that this large Bible, uh, which we've uh, used in a couple of situations, if you were here on Christmas Eve uh, for the children's service, you will saw Jerry uh, used this Bible to uh, read to the staff, but uh, this is across the street, uh, and we've had this a number of years. This was actually the original pulpit Bible from uh, Sharptown Church way back in the early 1900s. And so, this, is, this weighs a, a, a lot. Uh, let me just invite you to think with me for a moment that this book would represent your sin. All of the mistake, all of the sin, all of the shortcoming inside of your life. And then... Picture, if you will, the person of Jesus Christ who would be standing next to you. There are no books in his hand. There is no sin in him. But the Bible says that while he's hanging on the cross, Jesus placed on him my sin. He takes my 30-pound book, if you will. Not only mine, but yours, not only yours, but all of humanity's was placed on him. He became sin, the Bible says, was placed upon him. 
the one who knew no sin, sin was placed upon him for the salvation of the world. This is an image that has come down to us through literature as well. You remember many of you read the book Pilgrim's Progress. As Pilgrim, he was carrying his weight, his burden of sin until he came to the cross. And when he came to the cross, his sin rolled away. Bible school. Maybe first or second grade. Rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. All the burdens of my heart rolled away. This is the fun part. Every sin (laughs) has to go beneath the crimson flow. Hallelujah. Rolled away, rolled away rolled away, every burden of my heart rolled away. Somehow, miraculously, in the midst of this transaction, God placed on Jesus the sin of all of humanity. And in the midst of that transaction, He takes your sin, He takes my sin, while He's hanging on the cross. The weight of that, The weight of that becomes obvious in those three hours as the darkness rolls in. And as Jesus responds about the weight of the sin of the world. One last thing I want to go ahead and and share with you about that particular section. Because Isaiah sees this 700 years before. He's pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that was brought upon us, excuse me, the punishment that brought us peace was on him. The punishment was on him. And by his wounds, we're healed. The last thing that happens inside of this verse in 2 Corinthians 5.21 has to do with the idea That there is a great exchange that happens. God made him who had no sin be sin for us. He placed that on him to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There is a great exchange that happens. That he takes our sin and gives to us his righteousness. He takes our sin and gives to us his righteousness. Now, people who write about this particular verse talk about this great exchange that happens. And there are pages after pages after pages written. But let me just summarize this uh, with a couple of highlighted points. And is this. In that instant, as Jesus is suffering And bleeding and dying. The invitation for you upon the cross is an invitation for me as well. Our sinfulness we can exchange for his righteousness. Our sinfulness we can exchange for his righteousness. Our shame we can exchange for his glory. We want to hide from him. We want to go ahead and be distant from him. But the Bible says that even our best efforts are like filthy rags. He can take our shame and it can be exchanged for his glory inside of our life. He can take our curse. Headed for hell. But turned around and life can be a blessing. I'm reminded of the Bill Gaither song that he sings about something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness. But he made something beautiful of my life. 
We can exchange our brokenness for His healing. He can take our poverty and our lack and He can, in fact, exchange that for His abundance and His grace. He can take our rejection and exchange that for His acceptance. The Bible tells us that without Him, we are far off. But yet, because of the cross of Christ and His shed blood, we can draw near by faith. Our life can be exchanged, excuse me, our death can be exchanged for His life. All of that is wrapped up inside of the idea of the sacrificial blood of Christ. The substitution of Christ dying on the cross. The fact that He has bled and died for you and for me. Let's go to the next slide if we could. That's good. God made Him who had no sin to place on Him our sin so that we might exchange that for righteousness, for glory, for blessing, for healing, for abundance, for acceptance, and exchange our death for His life. I'm going to ask the music team if they'll make their way back toward the platform uh, at this time, and, and we're going to go ahead and, and close in just a moment. We're going to close with words that <clears throat> remind us of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ and how it is that over the years the church has looked to him and have said God made him who knew no sin to be sin for you and for me a sin offering wrapped up in the image of the Old Testament so that we might become and exchange our lives for his life we might become people who can share in the righteousness of God. Body the bread, his blood the wine, broken. So amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Messiah, name above all names, 
So as we close our time together today, let me just remind you that a great exchange has been offered, and a great exchange is offered, not just at Calvary in a very singular moment where Jesus Christ dies, but that offer is available for us today too. He wants to take these areas inside of our life and exchange them for all that He is. As we close this morning, I want to just invite you to pause with me for a word of prayer. And in this moment, if there are those things inside of your life that you would like to just exchange today for all that Jesus Christ is, recognize that there's not anything that we can do or anything that we bring, but it's all because that He wants to impute them to us and give them to us. Because of the three hours on the cross. Because of his shed blood. Will you pray with me? We pause in this moment, Lord, and recognize that the sinless offering of Jesus Christ, where you laid the sin of the world, my sin, our sin, collectively, the sin of humanity upon the pure and spotless and holy person of Jesus. That miraculously, in that transaction, although we have difficulty explaining what happens in that moment, the Bible tells us that by faith we step forward and exchange our life for the life that He wants to give to us inside of the person of Jesus Christ that we might be made righteous. Not just singularly as a single event, but an ongoing circumstance. And so we present ourselves. Continue, Lord, to shape, form, and mold us to be your children. That we might experience that relationship. Help us today as we're apart yet for another week. Will you find us in the midst of our time by ourself? Will you remind us that God made Jesus to be sin? Placed upon him the sin of the world so that we might be righteous. Lord, we ask today that you'll come in these moments By your Holy Spirit, encourage us and might we be your sons and daughters this week inside of our community, inside of our jobs, inside of our homes. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sharptown. God bless you.